Thank you, Nancy. Well, good morning and welcome, everyone. It is good to be with you in the house of the Lord. Hey, I just want to start with a few announcements today. If you don't have one of these uh, salmon-colored little bulletins, grab one of these and get some information about what's going on in the church. I'm not going to highlight everything, but one thing you won't find in your bulletin is we have a need of some additional um, uh, nursery workers. If you'd like to serve in the nursery or if you'd like to serve in the children's ministry for taking care of our children, please come see us. There's a need for uh, people serving in that way. Um, and our, our ministry to our children is, is a big deal, isn't it? We love to see them grow. And if you'd like to be a part of that, come, come talk to somebody about that. This week, we have the five-day club happening. So um, if you are involved with preparing snacks or serving in some way, you should have talked to Jubilee. <laughs> and if you would like to be involved, please go talk to Jubilee. And if otherwise you are not involved, I would ask you to pray. Pray this week as we have uh, students here. We don't know who's going to show up, so we, we're asking that the Lord does what He wants to do and that we'll be faithful to be a witness to our community and to love these children. So pray for the gospel, pray for the growth of the church and uh, these students coming to see Jesus. We um, also have a great blessing in our church to have our church services put online. And so um, for those of you who watch online, I'm glad that you do it. If, you, if you're watching online and, um, and you watch every week, I would encourage you to give me a call. Call the church. It helps me as I'm getting to know all of you. I'm visiting you. I want you to know if you would like to make an appointment with me to get some time to get together, feel free to give me a call and, and make sure that I get on your calendar. And I'll be doing the same thing, giving you a call and getting on your calendar. It's my desire to know you and to um, visit and, and love all of you. So let's begin our time with the reading of God's Word. Please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is the Word of God from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Father, as we come before you this morning to join with your people in, in your house to worship you and to hear your word, we pray that you would be praised. We thank you, Lord, that you sit enthroned above the heavens, that you look far down on the heavens and the earth, that you reign from the rising of the sun to its setting. You are God. We pray that you would prepare our hearts now to worship you that you would bless our time of fellowship together, and that you would be glorified among us as your word has its intended effect, and that you would shape and fashion us into your likeness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Glad to see everybody today. Let's sing the first song. It's called Forever, and part of it, it's part of the song that you just read out of the scriptures. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Oh, 
dismiss our children who are going to children's church to go and learn about the Lord. If there's any of them left, where'd my children go? Oh, there they are. Thank you, Linda. All right, let's pray. Lord, we pray for our children. We pray for us. We pray that you would direct our hearts to know you and to see you and to love you with all we are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this next song is a brand new song that Jacob, Pastor Jacob, gave me. And so I don't think you know it, but so we're going to teach it to you. And even if you just sing the chorus, that's okay. And it's, he picked it because it's going to fit right with all his sermons coming up. So Nancy, will you play just the melody on the chorus? Two, three, and four. sing these verses and when you feel like you can you join us okay come praise and glorify our God the Father of our Lord in Christ he has in heavenly reigns his blessing on us poor. for pure and blameless in his sight he destined us to be Son eternally. Here's the chorus.
you'll know this one. Blessed assurance. Those two words, wonderful. I encourage you to stand with me while we sing this one. to introduce this couple that uh, some of you may not know. Come on up, Gladys and Derek Willis, and uh, they're going to share a song with us at this time. So when I think of this song, uh, Roger came up with a scripture that kind of goes with it. <clears throat> and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. And I, as I am lifted up in the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. As for me, if I am lifted up in the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And <clears throat> that's what this song, the crux of it is, if you listen to it. And it's blessed us over the years as we sang it. <clears throat>
to us. Thank you for the words of these songs, and we ask that you open our ears now and let us hear what Pastor Jacob has to prepared for us, and we're hungry for your word, and we give you all the praise. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Derek and Gladys. It is good to sing and to glorify the Lord for what he's done together. Let me open with another word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our corporate worship. We pray that you would knit us together in love as we come to your word. We uh, pray that you would speak to us and give us ears to listen and obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, when I was young, uh, there were several books that meant a lot to me in my spiritual development as I grew in Christ. One of the books that was the most impactful for me was a book written by John Piper by the name of Don't Waste your life. I don't know if you've heard of it or read it. It's a good book. I would hardly recommend it. Um, in this book, Don't Waste Your Life, Piper argues that we should not waste our lives. And to think that a life could be wasted is an incredibly tragic thing because, as we know, you only have one life and then it's over. You don't get a, a redo or another chance. You get one life, not two. And, and to waste that one life that you have would be uh, a very sad thing. Of course, what a wasted life is, we can disagree about because we have different definitions of what a good, fulfilled, value-filled, and praiseworthy life is. Piper writes about an article that he came across in the uh, Reader's Digest about a couple uh, in their 50s who retired. And of course, retiring in your 50s is quite the feat and something to be praised by, by the world. They retired to a beach in Florida where they sailed on their 30-foot yacht and played softball in the compound club there at the retirement place where the people play softball. And they would go on the beach and collect shells. And Piper said, that is a tragedy which, of course, is not what we would expect to say for a very successful life. Of course, all of the work and sweat and money to be raised and everything that goes into what it takes to retire in your 50s. But Piper makes the argument that to live out the rest of your days playing softball, sailing on your ship, collecting shells on the beach is ultimately nothing compared to the eternity that we will spend one way or another. He says, imagine when this couple stands before the Lord and looks him in the eye. What will they say? Look, Lord, see my shell collection. 
It's humorous, but it's also incredibly tragic because a wasted life cannot be retaken. See, we were made for praise. We praise things every day. We value, we worship, we pursue some things over others. It's just what we do. Even though we have many different preferences about what we think is praiseworthy, I know I have preferences with my wife when it comes to food and this and that and how things are prepared, but there is no room for subjective debate when it comes to who is the most worthy of praise and beyond that, who has a rightful claim to your praise. The objects of your affections in this life, however praiseworthy you might think them, will not stand as an excuse when you stand before the Lord of glory at the end of days. As we turn to the book of Ephesians and see the passage of our study this morning, we will see a rich, beautiful description of the salvation that God has made available to us. Because of God's work in salvation, because this work that he has accomplished is so centrally foundational to his work in all of creation, we must respond to it. You may respond in rejection of who Jesus is, is of who Jesus is, in rejection of his claim to lordship, or you may respond by surrendering your life to his lordship, but either way your response when you see him face to face will be inevitable by victory or by defeat, the word says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the only choices that will be left to you are the choice of who will you praise now, today, and will you respond to Jesus now? The word of the Lord comes to us this morning from Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. Please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is the Word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of of his glory. Amen. You may be seated. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus while imprisoned in Rome. And if you're not familiar with Ephesus, in fact, Michael, do we have a, 
a map slide back there. Ephesus is a um, port city on the western coast of Turkey. Paul's missionary journeys took him up through this region of Turkey, up above into that land, up above Greece, and then down into Greece as he came down into Athens, into Corinth. And much of the letters that we have to these epistles in the New Testament are written to these cities. Ephesus, you'll remember, is described for us in, in Ephesians, in 1 Corinthians, and in Acts. It was a big city. It was a city of trade, being a big port city. And it was a place that Paul spent three years of his life ministering, perhaps the longest place that Paul spent at any of the churches that he started and visited. In these three years, Paul taught daily in, the, uh, in a lecture hall, and he worked to sustain himself, making tents, and he saw growth in the church as people came to Jesus and surrendered to him. Eventually, you may remember the big story in Acts when there was a riot because the silversmiths of Ephesus were going out of business. People were no longer buying the silver idols of Artemis, and they were turning to Jesus. And they said, hey, we're going to lose our jobs. We got to get rid of this Paul guy. And so they started this big riot, and they cried out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And, and they had to whisk Paul out of there because the people were going crazy. This is... Ephesus. It was a worldly city, but a place where the church grew. At the end of Paul's missionary journeys, he came back to the city. He had the elders meet them outside of town, and he blessed them. And he said, after my departure, there's going to come wolves into the church, and they're going to lead some astray. But keep the doctrine as you have been taught it. Guard this deposit. Preach this word. And none of you are going to see my face again. I'm going uh, the Spirit has me confined. I'm going to Jerusalem to bear witness to the gospel, but be of good courage, and he encourages them. And so this church in Ephesus was a major player in the early church. He writes to this church out of two sections, the first half of Ephesians and the second half of Ephesians divided straight down the middle, chapters 1 through 3 and 4 through 6. These chapters outline a rich description of, of who we are in Christ. That's chapters 1 through 3, who we are in Christ and what he has done for us. And 4 through 6 outline how we are to live in Christ, what we are to do, who we are to be based on what God has done for us. Together, the whole of Ephesians lays out for the church who we are and what we are to do. And it is foundational for us as a church as well. Thanks, Michael. You can take it down if you want. As we begin our first section in verse 3, Paul, st or, excuse me, Paul starts by reminding us that who we are is rooted in God's sovereign purpose of salvation. And in light of the amazing salvation that God has given to us, we must respond. Thankfully, our passage gives us two ways in which we should respond. Our first point will be that we should respond to God's great salvation by praising Him. And secondly, we should respond by aligning our lives to His sovereign purpose. First, we should respond by praising God for the great blessings of salvation. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What God has given to us is amazing, earth-shaking. It extends beyond the earth to the heavens and the reason for which everything was made. It was made for God's glory. And God glorifies himself as he saves those whom he wishes. He is to be praised because every blessing that we have comes from him. And we really need to know what those blessings are. If we don't meditate and chew on what God has given to us, we're not going to cherish it. But if we're going to cherish the gospel, if we're going to cherish who we are in Christ, it is good for us to know and reflect on and meditate what exactly God has done for us in our great salvation. The first blessing that God has given us in our great salvation in verse 4 is that the Father has chosen us. 
even as He chose us in Him, verse 4, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace. There's several elements here that really make God's choosing of us incredibly rich. First of all, God has chosen us in His sovereign will before the foundation of the earth. He made, He formed, and He has chosen us. This is something that God does, and He has done it for His glory and for our joy as we are graciously drawn to Him. He has chosen us for a reason, that we may be holy and blameless before Him. It's not simply a, you have been chosen so that you can sit on Jesus' team. It's you have been chosen so that you can be new, that you have been brought from death to life, that you are a new creation. And as a new creation, we are to live holy lives of pure purity and, and blamelessness before the Lord. We have been chosen to be adopted as sons. That's crazy that we can be called sons and daughters of God, that He is our Father and we are His children. Just the picture of adoption itself is an incredibly beautiful one. I have great respect for those Christian couples who choose to adopt because adopting, going through the process, sometimes very difficult and long and expensive, the great cost that it takes to take someone who is not of your flesh and blood and to bring them into your family so that they belong with you and you belong with them. It's a beautiful picture because it's exactly what Jesus has done for us, what the Lord has chosen us for. We have been bought with a price. We have been brought into this family so that we can belong to the Lord. As I think about that, picture of adoption, how we each were just like orphans, lost, homeless, without a family, without someone to call our own or to call father. And apart from our worthiness, God in his gracious love chose you. He chose to bring you into his family. He chose to show you his gracious love. And the fact that we have been chosen is an incredible blessing. We should praise God because of his choosing. And that's exactly what Paul writes. God has chosen us, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. He didn't have to choose you. That's why it's grace. He chose you because he chose to give grace to you. And... His choosing gives glory to the fact that He gives grace and it gives us reason to praise Him because this life, the life that I have, the life that I have in Jesus is not my own. I have been chosen, I have been brought, I have been adopted and I am thankful eternally to, to the Lord for what He has done for me. Secondly, we have blessings in Jesus. It is interesting to see the Trinity in this passage. God the Father chooses us to be his own, but we also have reasons to praise because of what Jesus has done and because of what the Holy Spirit has done. Specifically in Christ, in Jesus and his death on the cross, we have several blessings to praise God for as well. Verse 7 and following, in him, specifically in Jesus now, we have redemption through his blood. Being redeemed is being brought from a state of worthlessness to a state of worthiness, from a state of being condemned to a state of being praised. We were worth nothing. We had nothing to give of value or of praise. We were justly condemned and deserving the wrath of God for our sin. But Jesus, in his death on the cross, through his blood, pays 
that death penalty that we deserve to pay. Not only that, he brings us into favor with God by giving to us his righteousness. So that when Jesus looks at you, when God the Father looks at you, he does not see your sin because the blood of Jesus has paid for your sin. When God the Father looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Not your righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness for you. And so we have been redeemed by what Jesus has done through his blood and brought into life and relationship with God. That is amazing. Every day we have pictures of redemption, taking something that is worthless and bringing it into worth. Maybe you see a couch on the side of the road with a big free sign on it. Maybe you see something in disrepair and you think, you know, instead of throwing this away, I'm going to fix it. But when you do that, you redeem something and it does us good to remember that we have been redeemed, that we were worthless, that we were condemned and Jesus has brought us out of that condemnation and put us into relationship and praise a praiseworthy status before God the Father. One of the other things that Jesus has given us, besides redeeming us through his blood in verse 7, is also giving us a revelation of God's will. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. The Bible uses the word mystery to describe something that has not always been clearly known. This has been something that has been clouded by God's sovereign plan. Nobody has always known exactly what this is about or exactly what this is doing, but now this has been made known to you. It wasn't fully known in the past. Now it is made known to you. And this mystery that is made known to us is who God is, and what he is doing. And those two things are the most foundational, amazing things that we could ever wrap our minds around in this life. Out of all the learning and the schools out there, out of all knowledge there is to be had by human beings, the knowledge of who God is and what he has done is the most important knowledge. Because without this knowledge, none of us could come to Christ. None of us could know God. Jesus says that no one knows the Father except the Son. And no one knows the Son except the Father. The God has a relationship in himself where he is known. And nobody can know God like God knows himself. Which is exactly why we need someone from God to tell us who he is. If we did not have the person of Jesus Christ in the flesh, uh, fully God and fully man, to show us who God is, we could not know God. That's why Jesus says, no one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can know the Father except the Son and any to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The Pharisees thought they knew, Jesus, they knew God. They thought that they knew God the Father. And Jesus says, no, you don't. If you knew the Father, you would know me because Jesus is the revelation of God to us. His literal incarnation that God took on flesh to live among us, to die for us, and so that we can have an intercessor between us and God who understands us and our weaknesses, and we can understand God and who he is. This knowledge that is made known to us, this mystery in Christ, that we know who God is and we know what he is doing, is truly amazing. He has revealed to us a plan, what God's plan is. God's plan, which he set forth in Christ, verse 10, is a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. 
And just as it, in case it comes as a surprise to you, God's plan for the fullness of time is to unite all things in Christ. We will stand before him one day and we will look him face to face. And when we do, thinking about our shell collection will be extremely pointless because Jesus Christ and the salvation that he has brought to us and his exaltation above everything in life, everything in the heavens, everything in the earth, his praise is the point of life. And everything beyond that is ultimately pointless. And it is a gracious thing that God has made his plan known to us. More than just the redemption through his blood and the plan that we know that we have been revealed, that we, have, we are able to know God, we also have an inheritance that cannot be taken away. Verse 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of, of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Again, part of being brought into the family of God, being an orphan, being worthless, having no home to speak of, no worth of our own, we have been redeemed, we have been purchased, we have been adopted as sons, and now as the family of God, as the sons and daughters of the king, we have a royal inheritance, a hope, a future gift coming to us that our home is in heaven and our possessions lie in heaven. Everything we could ever want and have ultimately resides with God in heaven who gives to us every good thing. When we look at the word inheritance, we often can think of things of this life, of when my parents pass away and I get their money, right? Like the, the prodigal son, he's like, give me my inheritance now, I don't want to wait. Um, but our, our real inheritance is not in this life. It is in the life to come when we stand before the Lord and are fully satisfied in Him. Amen. We should praise God because He has given us everything. We have gone from darkness into light, from having nothing into having everything, from having no home, no future, and no prospects of inheritance to having an everlasting promise in Jesus that he is preparing a place for us, that where he is, we also will be, and he will come again and bring us so that where he is, we will be also. This is an amazing thing, and we should praise God because this inheritance is given to us to the praise of his glory. Life isn't about you. Life isn't even about the fact that you are saved. You are saved to bring God praise and glory. And because of that, we certainly should praise him and glorify his name for what he has done in us. Lastly, another reason why we should praise God for the blessings that he has given us is that through the Holy Spirit, we have been sealed. Verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit as a result of our salvation. When we choose to believe in Jesus, when we repent of our sin, when we turn from our evil ways, and when we surrender our lives to the Lord, something happens. Something new is created in us. He takes out our heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh. We become a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. And we are given the Holy Spirit, the helper who is with us 
who never leaves us as a result of the new life that God has given us. He has brought us from death into life. And with the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are sealed. The idea of a seal is you have hot wax and you take some signet ring or some stamp or marker and you seal it in the wax and the wax is super hot and then it dries and it becomes this seal. We seal our envelopes when you lick them. Just don't cut your tongue, get a paper cut. That's gnarly, right? But you seal it to say this is done. It is closed and it is given for a future time because it will be opened at the right time by the right person. That's why the Romans used their seals. And in the same way, you, your life, has been sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. It's a done deal. You belong to him. You will see him face to face. Your sins have been atoned for, and you are a son and a daughter of the king. This is an incredible hope that we can have blessed assurance. Jesus is mine because of this promise that God has given to us. We have been given a seal. When I was a youth pastor, I used to play some fun games with my students as youth pastors do. One of those fun games involves some uh, rock, paper, scissors. I don't know if you guys ever play rock, paper, scissors. You know, there's lots of variations of it. You play rock, paper, scissors, but there's a twist. And the twist is, if we play rock, paper, scissors, and if I win, I get to put my initials on your nose with a Sharpie. But as traumatizing as that may be, the risk is 50-50. If you win, you get to put your initials on my nose with a Sharpie. And then somebody wins, somebody loses, and you go around the room and you play again. Well, eventually you get a room full of students whose poor noses are all inked up with Sharpies of so-and-so and and like, aha, I get to put my initials on your nose. I have marked you. I have won and I've put my mark on you. Well, in a less silly way, as Christians, we are described as being those who are bought, purchased, purchased and owned by the king. And in Revelation, we are given a picture that the name of God is on us, sealed on us. And just as I may win a victory over you and put my initials on your nose, Jesus has won a victory over sin and death, and you are his. And that should give us tremendous reason to praise. We have a guarantee that our inheritance is coming, that nothing and no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand, and we await that day when we will acquire possession of our inheritance to the praise of His glory. We should praise God for what He has done, for the hope that He has given us in the Father, in the Son, in the Holy Spirit. We have been chosen. We have been redeemed. We have been told and shown the mystery of his will so that we know what is the purpose of life. We have a reason for hope when life is down, when the world totters. We know that God is working his purpose in Christ and nothing will shake that purpose. We have a heavenly home, a future with God forever that cannot be taken away from you because the Spirit himself has sealed you in Christ and you are his. God has done so much for us, and we should praise him for it every day. The reason why Christians can grow cold in their love is because they forget what God has done for us. In fact, a fun fact is this church in Ephesus is commended by the Lord Jesus in Revelation for being a church that is able to distinguish between truth truth and error. But the Lord Jesus rebukes the church in Ephesus because they lost the love that they had at first. And my prayer is that that would not describe us. But the only way that we will be able to retain our first love is if we cherish what God has done for us. If we remember it every day and if we praise him continually for what he has done. 
There's a song I remember. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. Not only should we respond to the amazing salvation that God has given us by praising him, but we also should respond with a changed life. It's not lip service only, although certainly if we do not cry out in praise, the rocks will cry out. We ought to praise him with our lips, but not only with our lips. We ought to praise him with a changed life that brings him honor, which brings us to our second point. Our second point is that we should respond to the great salvation that God has given to us by bringing our lives into alignment with his purpose. Verse 4, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world for a reason. What is that reason? That we should be holy and blameless before him. A Christian who is not living a holy life for the Lord arguably is not a Christian. Because to be in Christ is to be made new and given all of these good things in order to live before the Lord in holiness and blamelessness. Now, of course, we all struggle and we continue to struggle with sin every day. But the point is strong. You were saved. You were chosen. You were redeemed. Not so that you could sit around and enjoy your life, but so that you could live a holy life and a blameless life, a life that brings praise to the Lord. We must live in obedience to the Lord, and obedience will inevitably bring us into a greater degree of holiness before him as the old man is put off and the new man is put on, as we grow in the fruits of the Spirit and as we look more like Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Another way that we should respond by bringing our lives into alignment is by continually reminding ourselves of God's purpose. See, the thing is, I can't live in alignment with God's purpose unless I know what it is, unless I'm continually reminded about what it is. Like, vision statements, like the things that we put before our eyes so that we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I need to put before my eyes, what is the purpose of life? I don't know about you, but I like watching movies and I get caught up in the plot of a movie. I get caught up in the story and I want to know how it ends. I lay there with my wife in bed and she puts a movie on and she's out. Five minutes. And I love my wife. And I'm glued. I'm glued for the next hour and a half and I can't go to sleep because I have to know how the story ends. And let me tell you, as we go through this life, there will be seasons that you wake up as if you just finished a movie and you were like, what? What is going on? What is the purpose of life? And why am I here? And what am I doing? Because sometimes it can seem so bleak and so purposeless. But there is a purpose. God has made it known to us. God has given us his purpose. Verse 9, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. The purpose of life and the purpose consequently of your life is the praise and honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Everything will be united in him one day. And God is bringing that day at his time. And we look forward to that day. And as I look forward to that day, I remember that every day of my life should be in that purpose. If that is God's purpose for the universe, then that should also be my purpose for today. Today, how will I bring praise and glory to the name of Jesus? How will I live to the praise of his glory? We must choose to give ourselves over to this purpose. It's not enough just to know. Okay, I know that this is God's purpose for all of life. I know that this is God's purpose for heaven and for earth. 
the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the clovers, the insects, the animals, the river, the beauty of the Willamette Valley. All of this is for the glory of Jesus' name. And then I'm just going to go, you know, do what I want to for the rest of the afternoon because it's my life and don't tell me what to do. Isn't that crazy? It's not enough to know that this is the purpose for all of life. You must choose to give yourself over to this purpose, having no other purpose more important than the purpose of the praise and the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I like uh, 1700s, 1800s naval combat, the big sailing ships with their tall sails. I like looking at pictures of big ships. I like reading books. Have you ever seen the movie Master and Commander? You know, I just love those kinds of things. And I love reading those books where they're, they're working hard and beating against wind and tide to get to their place of destination and to conquer the enemy, those darn Frenchies, right? Well, anyway, as I'm reading these books, I come across a very interesting situation that happens on these old naval ships. When you're running away for your life and there's a bigger ship with more guns and more sails, and it's coming for you, there's something interesting that those sailors do. They toss stuff overboard, right? Has anybody ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Oh, toss the rum overboard. No, not the rum. But everything is going overboard because in that situation, there's only one thing that matters. We need to get away. We need to run. We need to be faster than the bigger, badder ship that's pursuing us. And everything that does not give us that purpose is chucked overboard. In the books that I read, they even go so far as to chuck their cannons overboard. And you think, wait a minute, don't you need those? It's like, well, if you are confident that this ship is going to blow you out of the water and fighting is not going to work, cannons go overboard, splash, 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 because the only thing that matters for your life is sailing as fast as you can. And I find that there's something powerful there for the Christian life because there is only one thing that matters for your life. And everything that you carry on board in your life that misleads you and weighs you down from that purpose is going to slow you down and bring you the way that you don't want to go. What would it look like if we lived lives full tilt, full send, Everything goes overboard because my life is to the praise of his glory. We would be a fearsome looking bunch and a church to be used in Jesus' hands for sure. Does your life look like this? Does it have one purpose? There are many things in life that are praiseworthy. There are many things in life that we enjoy, that we love, that we pursue with our praise and with our passions. But there's only one thing that matters. One day, you will stand before Jesus face to face. I don't know if you've let that sink in. You will see Jesus face to face. And you can't avoid it. It will happen. That's either incredibly encouraging or kind of scary, right? But the truth is you will see him. And when you look him in the eye, your collection of shells, your toys, your yacht, your comfort, your leisurely retirement, none of it will matter because the culmination of everything of heaven and of earth is wrapped around the eternal praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's eternal purpose has been revealed to us. We praise God for what he has done, and we certainly want our lives to look like he has saved us. The questions that remain for us today is, who will you praise? What purpose will you live for? Just one closing illustration. In that book, Don't Waste Your Life, it was the book that meant so much to me when I was young, Piper describes a plaque that 
was in his kitchen growing up, and he remembers it to this day. It's this simple plaque hanging in the kitchen of a green hill and two trees on the hill and this brown path that goes up the hill and disappears over the other side. And on the plaque are these simple words. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are so amazing. Truly, you are to be praised because of every spiritual blessing that you have given us. And if we're being truthful, Lord, we don't think about every spiritual blessing that you have given us as much as we should. Help us to know the depths and the riches of the wonders of God. Help us not to lose a sense of awe and wonder at the cross. Help us to cherish the gospel by which we have been brought from death to life. And Lord, help us to have changed lives that live in holiness, that live with a purpose in life. May our lives also be to the praise of your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jacob. Who learned something I did? I know that. Thank you. I'm going to have you stand and we're going to sing, I Stand Amazed. Some in glory is faith. 
face I shall lash and see. It will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. And how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Savior, love for me. Oh, wonderful singing. Hey, everybody have a seat just a minute. And uh, Pastor Ken and Ginger, would you come up just a minute? Yeah, come on up. We're going to have them sing a special. No, I... <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. We're really not going to make you sing. So don't no. So Yeah, I know. I've heard you sing. No. No. <laughs> Um, so, Pastor Ken and Ginger, we want you to face the, face the audience out here, face the church, and look out the window to that red tractor, Pastor Ken. So, so, so in appreciation for an incredible job of the last year and a half, the church bought you that tractor. And... and uh, and it's got grater, it's got a rototiller, it's got everything. And um, but you gotta let Ginger drive it once in a while. <laughs> so we appreciate, and you got a pastor, a new pastor, and we appreciate all the work. And let's give him a hand for a help, shall we? are such a blessing to us. You have no idea how you ministered to Gent and I. We had some difficult times and we worked through them together shoulder to shoulder. I just want to say to you thank you so very much and praise God for the way that he has loved us and brought us together as a church family. I am overwhelmed. Thank you. Well, I'd encourage you to stick around for some food and fellowship after the service, and let me uh, bless us with this word from Philippians 1, verses 9 and following. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May the Lord bless you this week.